Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Conversations with Tyler. Today, I'm very happy to be chatting with Valina Chakarova, who is a geopolitical strategist with longstanding experience. She is founder of a group, FACE, which stands for For a Conscious Experience. I first learned of Valina by reading her on Twitter. Valina, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with you, and I look forward to a highly interesting conversation. Now, you're from Bulgaria, so I've long wondered, the First and Second Balkan Wars that preceded World War I, do they still matter today, or what did we learn from them? Well, of course they matter in a sense, because you are probably familiar with the term Balkanization. And unfortunately, the term Balkanization, that means splitting a country into smaller parts in order for external powers to interfere, uh, to play, you know, different uh, political actors off against each other. And that kind of things is still very much relevant. And it's being used and applied to other regions, to other parts of the world. It matters also in terms of sentiments and in terms of, uh, you know, if you like, moods, um, if you take a look at the political landscape in most of uh, the, let's say, Balkan countries, we still call our region the Balkan region, even though that uh, outsiders describe it as Southeast Europe mostly. Um, you will find all of these sentiments being kind of, you know, reflected in various political groups and parties. We have nationalists in most of these countries, uh, which are getting stronger by the day and are running for, you know, for, for elections and are using actually agenda and narratives uh, that have been known for the last uh, 200 years. Uh, so um, all in all, it's, uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, quite, quite relevant. And even let me use another example. Uh, the incident, the helicopter clash, uh, crash uh, from yesterday where uh, President, uh, the Iranian president and the, for, uh, the foreign minister, um, you know, uh, passed away, was used as an example by some analysts already. Uh, I will just uh, use the reference here uh, that it could be the next arrival moment. Now, again, we have, you know, Balkan Wars and then we had also, as you know, the big, uh, you know, moment, the biggest black swan as being described by Professor Nassim Taleb, uh, the Sarajevo moment from 1914, that uh, was an unanticipated event, which eventually resulted in the first world, you know, war. So even now, this reference is being used as, um, you know, survival moment is something that is, you know, defined as a black swan event and that could, uh, you know, lead to a major military conflict, if not even, let's say, another world war. So all in all, these kind of things are still uh, kind of uh, relevant, even though we, that it, they are not uh, having the same, of course, uh, influence or scale as it used to be the case uh, 200 years ago. Now, Bulgarian nationalism in the past, as you know, it's so often been about dreams of a greater Bulgaria. And there are Bulgarian minorities in Albania, different parts of the Balkans. And this notion of creating something like a Bulgarian world or San Stefano Bulgaria with larger borders but with current demographic collapse in Bulgaria, and migration to the EU, other places, low birth rates, what is the future of Bulgarian nationalism? Does it, does it have a future at all? Um, I think that the second part of the question is easier to be answered. Yes, so nationalism, as I already outlined, is always going to have uh, some sort of uh, a solid ground in the whole region, including Bulgaria. And again, right now we have a very strong, uh, you know, sentiment, nationalistic sentiment that is also uh, you know, uh, finding a political reflection. Um, and we have elections uh, in June uh, for a parliament since the coalition government between the conservatives and the liberals uh, has went, uh, you know, parted ways. Uh, but um, g coming to, you know, the, f you know, the first part of uh, your question, um, these sentiments will be politicized and instrumentalized, but they will not find a common denominator among the population in Bulgaria. The dream of, let's say, San Stefano Bulgaria 
or if you like, you know, uh, big Bulgaria, including, you know, um, parts of uh, other countries, uh, neighbors is, is over. This is not going to, you know, uh, come back uh, specifically in the case of Bulgaria. I would argue actually in the case of uh, the other neighbors as well, unless we see a major, uh, you know, uh, process that right now I don't see happening in the short term um, of, uh, let's say, dissolvement of uh, the European Union, because so long as these uh, countries are part of uh, the European Union or are candidates for the European Union, this kind of uh, conflicts will always uh, find, um, you know, a kind of solution mechanism within uh, the institutions and there will be enough incentives for broader part uh, of uh, the parties um, and um, actors, uh, you know, to find a common denominator. So, um, yes, even countries like uh, North Macedonia, and we saw that there were immediately conflict. Uh, a kind of a verbal conflict between uh, North Macedonia and uh, Greece because uh, the newly elected president of North Macedonia don't, didn't use the full name but used only the name of Macedonia. This kind of uh, sensitivities will remain but uh, again they do not find a common denominator even in these countries. Now going back to the demographics, I think this is a bigger issue because right now and probably the most famous, uh, you know, uh, person right now who is uh, making the case, the strong case of uh, shrinking uh, demographics all, all over the world, with a few exceptions, of course, because Africa and Southeast Asia will still see at macro level kind of uh, positive demographics. But in general, Bulgaria is probably one of the fastest uh, shrinking, uh, you know, demographically shrinking countries in the world, not just in Europe. And here we have a very, very, you know, serious issue that is a systematic and a structural issue that goes back to 30 years of uh, political mismanagement, corruption, and, uh, you know, precarious, uh, I would say, socioeconomic indicators. So it's not just about the missing birth rates. It's also about the skyrocketing, uh, you know, death rates in this country. And, um, you know, more or less uh, three million, three and a half million people who have uh, uh, sold their, you know, happiness and uh, tried to find their luck outside of the country, which is quite telling. Are the countries in the Balkans the right size? Are there too many of them? So if we go back to the Balkan Wars, well, first, Bulgaria and a number of other countries take from the Ottoman Empire. Then you turn around and basically a year later, countries take from Bulgaria. Is there any stability in that region without an outside hegemon? There is a stability outside uh, the... Uh, you know, the influence exercise, uh, exercised by uh, hegemon, uh, for instance, through the balance of uh, several external powers. This is the case right now. So we do not have a hegemonic power in the region right now. We have, let's say, if you like, a balance act of uh, several external and very powerful actors. Uh, that's not just, uh, you know, the European Union with its due economic cloud. Uh, it's also Russia still very much active in the region. And we have also Turkey, which is also, of course, quite active. And we have the United States and China also trying to have, uh, you know, to play their leverage in the region. So you see that it's not one specific hegemon. That's always been the case, by the way, if you would like to go back to the Balkan Wars, if you would like to go back to previous periods of uh, uh, the Balkan, uh, you know, the re of the Balkan region, you would find out that uh, once again, it was a competition of several empires. And each of these empires was trying to get a chunk of this region for itself. Um, and practically through this balancing act, uh, you know, these small uh, states were trying to, you know, capitalize um, uh, on their own interests. And this is uh, a continuum, a geopolitical continuum that uh, is uh, still very much, uh, you know, uh, in play in this region. Why do you think it is, say, that Bulgaria and Serbia remain closer to Russia, even with Putin? Or if you compare Czechia and Slovakia, Slovakia seems much closer to Russia, or at least some parts of Slovakia, than Czechia does. What, what, what predicts which nations in Eastern Europe will have this attraction to the East? 
first and foremost, I would say it's cyclical. It's not just, you know, you, you don't have a recipe that uh, reflects uh, on the realities on the ground, uh, you know, one on one. You have a very strong uh, cultural, personal, cu cultural and historical roots. Of course, specifically in this region, you have uh, religious uh, and uh, also post-imperial, imperial, post-imperial post roots. I mean, uh, in the case of the Russian Empire, there has been, you know, I would argue that what we see right now with Russia is, uh, you know, a continuum of uh, uh, the Russian Empire DNA. And uh, and practically, uh, I use this uh, golden rule of uh, the closer the better, you know, in terms of uh, influence and in terms of penetration and subversion, the closer to the core, uh, the bigger the influence. We saw this clearly also during the Cold War with uh, Bulgaria being probably the most uh, affected and, uh, you know, highly uh, influenced uh, satellite with almost no saying in what whatever, you know, topics. And uh, at the same time, if you look at uh, the policies um, and actions of uh, uh, Soviet bloc satellites such as Poland or uh, Czechoslovakia at the time, you will see that they had uh, much more space to act and uh, they were more, you know, they were prone to more, you know, uh, turmoil, uh, internal turmoil, even Hungary, if you, if you, uh, consider they had, uh, you know, their moments of, uh, turning against the Soviet Union. No, this hasn't been the case with, uh, with Bulgaria. In the case of Serbia, because again, you cannot use a common denominator. You cannot just say that these two, because they were geographically and still are geographically closer, they would be, you know, more, uh, influenced by Russia, because in the case of Serbia, being, you know, um, still in a very, very specific situation following the collapse of Yugoslavia, trying to find uh, external partners that support, you know, the, uh, the leadership, at the same time facing new realities with uh, uh, the buildup of uh, the other uh, states, uh, Slovenia, uh, Croatia, Bosnia, Montenegro, and so on and so forth. Of course, Serbia was in a dire need to have a very strong uh, uh, supporter, and it find it it has found this supporter in the face of uh, Russia. In the Bulgarian case, this is more historic. It has a sentiment in the Bulgarian uh, population. Uh, even uh, up until today, that has to do with, um, uh, you know, with um, um, emancipation of the Bulgarian uh, state, the third Bulgarian state following, you know, uh, the Russian-Turkish uh, war from uh, 1878. And then practically because of the Russian Empire, Bulgaria could regain its statehood. And the first Tsar of Bulgaria was also uh, practically uh, from uh, from the Russian Empire with Alexander Battenberg. So we had a very different, you know, mode of uh, of um, of uh, let's say uh, development and at the same time um, influence, you know. Um, today we have, for instance, political parties in Bulgaria that are still very much, let's say, um, uh, rooted in the same mindset that uh, one needs an internal friendship with Russia, that this is the only way forward. Even on behalf of the social so social democrats, the social democrats, you will find these kind of voices. We have a Bulgarian president who is very much also pro-Russian, even though that he will deny it. So you see that this kind of layers of uh, you know uh, influence and uh, penetration uh, to some extent are very very. You you know, are manifold. You will have uh, some that are taking place on a, on a free, let's say, free base out of uh, political conviction or out of individual, you know, uh, conviction. But you will have also some instrumentalized influences. I wouldn't uh, use any generalization for the region, except, as I said, this gold, golden rule that uh, could be applicable, that, of course, um, uh, the geographic approximation, 
uh, is uh, certainly an indicator that will tell you a lot about how an external and powerful player would uh, behave towards uh, the smaller neighbors and will try to, of course, increase its leverage uh, via via different uh, mechanisms and uh, actions. And uh, this goes through cultural ties, through personal business uh, ties, but also political uh, and economic projects. So it goes also via instrumentalization of dependencies, raw materials, and all of these kind of things. Like, let me give you another example, uh, just to end, end up this topic. If you go to Serbia nowadays and ask the, and you know, just conduct a poll, uh, in the Serbian population and ask who is, you know, the, uh, one of the biggest um, investors in Serbia, you know, a lot of people will tell you that uh, this is Russia, which is actually not the case. It's not uh, factual uh, because still the European Union is in fact the biggest institutional uh, investor in the country. But it tells you a lot about perception, how Russia is being perceived in terms of uh, its uh, strong role in, you know, in the country. Maybe we'll come back to Bulgaria, but let me try some questions about the broader world. Why is it you think China will not attack Taiwan? They claim it is theirs, and arguably in five to ten years, they'll be able to neutralize our submarine advantage from the U.S. with underwater drones and surveillance of our submarine presence. At that point, why don't they just move on Taiwan and try to take it? Well, I I do understand that there is a lot of, uh, you know, an analysis coming out right now, especially on behalf of the military uh, experts, um, not only in the United States, but also in other parts of the world, pointing to this realistic scenario that we may see a military attack by China on Taiwan by not later than 2027. And why 2027? Because uh, it is uh, being anticipated as the year when China will be able to catch up militarily with the United States. And I do not share this assessment. I just don't see why, uh, you know, China will have to take such a big risk in achieving something that it can achieve in a much smarter and more efficient way. What do I mean by that? I call this approach a debt by a thousand cuts. That's, that would mean that China could spend a little bit longer um, in a slow but steady political, social, economic and societal penetration of Taiwan. And it is, you know, you could, we could argue it's the old uh, Soviet playbook. Um, it could be done in a more subtle way using um, plausible deniability. It could be, you know, Taiwan is still uh, the most successful democracy in uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, that means also it is vulnerable to this kind of penetration where you can practically use um, agents provocateur, uh, provocateurs on the ground. You can buy up a lot of uh, uh, institutional or uh, individual players. You can, you know, start uh, doing all this subversion process in a, let's say, longer time frame, but it could bring about uh, bigger success than actually risking uh, military intervention, uh, which uh, is not, you know, n not giving you, um, I would even say, 50-50% of success. Um, the terrain of Taiwan, if we compare, compare it with the most, let's say, with the most sophisticated war that's going on right now, uh, is much more difficult. You have a very, very limited um, window uh, to attack. Uh, in the case of uh, Taiwan, uh, this window of opportunity is limited only to probably two uh, periods in the whole year, which of course is also known by everyone in the region, and that particularly means uh, the defense of Taiwan. You have a, a window of opportunity in April and then in October. So you cannot attack at any, you know, 
uh, time in the year. Uh, it is a um, sophisticated military attack that it cannot be conducted on the whole of the island. And even though that uh, China is catching up militarily right now, I think that the mindset of the Chinese leadership, the way how the Chinese leadership is, perf you know, is actually conducting strategy, um, does contradict such risky endeavor. Um, again, um, because time is on China's side and China only needs to really prepare this sum of minor actions in a longer period of time. At least this is what I would uh, actually uh, do uh, as, a, as a strategist, which would promise a much, uh, you know, better percentage of uh, success than, uh, like I said, an adventurous military attack. Now, we may argue that under unanticipated circumstances for the political leadership, think of a situation where the political stability uh, in China is shaken, where the Chinese leader Xi Jinping is somehow put into the corner to take a very, um, let's say, um, ad hoc decision on the matter because of certain circles of the hoax, of the military hoax, of course we have this kind of uh, possibility as well. Uh, it could be a black swan event, something that has happened in China and this makes him, you know, take this decision in order to draw the attention away from internal problems. Um, and foreign policy adventures are always, always kind of, you know, gathering the public uh, support. So. It's not 100% to be excluded, but in my scenario, I would actually point to rather, uh, you know, as I explained, this um, th death by thousand cuts uh, approach rather than military attack uh, on Taiwan. Are we now in a world where the laws of war are basically obsolete? So Putin is acting in Ukraine without restraint, killing civilians, the conflict in the Middle East, whatever one might think of it, there's clearly a lot of disagreement about it. So the ICC, the morning of this recording, is bringing charges against Netanyahu in the Israeli government. The United States government does not really recognize that as legitimate. Do we have international law anymore at all? Well, we have international law, but uh, in the world of, uh, you know, realpolitik and geopolitics, the strong... Uh, the strong do what they want and the weak suffer what they must. And this is the principle, unfortunately, that more or less overrides international law norms and rules. And right now in this gray um, area of, um, let's say, of a, of a interministic international system, so the old international system is crumbling down. And the new international system is trying to, uh, to, to, um, to be born. So we are in this, um, say, let's say a stadium of an emergence of a new global system in which each and single field, including the international law, we see it also with international organizations such as the United Nations. The United Nations Security Council is the perfect example for it, where we have clear, uh, you know, bipolarization, bifurcation of uh, the club uh, between China and Russia on the one hand and uh, United States, France and UK on the other. And the same goes for all these international bodies. Uh, and that is, uh, that is to say that they are being, of course, used on both sides. And at the same time, they are being, you know, misused. Unfortunately, that is the reality we are, we are right now. We are in um, this period of international relations where the number of international military conflicts and wars hasn't been that high since the end of uh, the Cold War. So it's the highest number of military conflicts and wars. We have a lot of, as you said, casualties. We have, um, I argue, uh, we are going to have even more tensions and more military conflicts in the next years to come with this year, 2024, being extremely volatile. Um, and in a sense, uh, I'm not surprised that we are in this situation where both sides 
are trying to instrumentalize legal norms, rules, standards, but to no avail because in the end, uh, up until we do not have, uh, let's say, uh, a new winner or new emerging blocks with their reading of international uh, law, with their understanding of uh, organizational principles, with their structures, um, we will be in this gray zone of uh, interpretation and misinterpretation and practically uh, there is n almost no common ground in between. Uh, we do see that there is no more uh, global, po you know, policemen, uh, a power that can decide over the end of military conflicts or wars. Uh, at the same time, we also see that um, uh, more or less the narratives that are coming uh, from both sides are equally being uh, instrumentalized because uh, on the one hand, right now you mentioned the case of uh, the Middle East. In fact, I argue that uh, the war between Israel and Hamas probably will find its way by the end of this year as compared to some other tensions that will be still ongoing and like the war, for instance, in Ukraine, which will still be ongoing in the next uh, several years. Uh, but here we have a clear case where uh, you see that the West, United States, European Union powers are supporting Israel and countries like China, Russia are actually support, uh, supporting the Palestinian, uh, in, uh, the Palestinian question. And I argue that in the end, probably, uh, this kind of balance, balancing act will, uh, be, uh, the positive influence on finding a two-state solution for this uh, conflict with devastating humanitarian consequences for the Palestinian people, without a doubt. Let's say that Putin manages to take and then keep something like a third of Ukraine, and then there's an uneasy truce. Uh, what would Putin do next? Is it Suwalki Gap? Is it Lithuania? Is it Eastern Estonia? Is it Moldova? Uh, play out the scenario in that case. Okay, so first, let's start with the calculus, what Putin wants. I would like to give you my assessment uh, as to what's going on there and what's been going on there for quite some time now. Now, first and foremost, uh, Putin wants the whole of Ukraine, not just one third of Ukraine or 20%. Right now, Russia controls around 18%. Uh, no, they want all of it. And if it's necessary... They will just make, you know, 10 to 15 years planned how to slowly but surely subjugate the whole of Ukraine. That means in a similar way how it's been preceded since 2014, you had practically um, a series of military actions uh, followed by ceasefire followed by some kind of negotiations, then followed by military actions and rinse and repeat tactics. This was the case for uh, almost 10 years. And due to this, you know, um, kind of strategy, Russia was able to military con militarily control uh, Eastern, uh, the, you know, Eastern uh, Ukraine and then uh, it could seize the opportunity to make uh, a move. Uh, of course, I have to say that in my assessment um, from from December 2021, um, I was pointing to uh, a scenario in which I was absolutely sure that there will be a war, but um, I actually even called this war a limited military operation. And I thought, this was my mistake, that the war will... Uh, start in the east and south of uh, of Ukraine. Um, I did not think that Putin will make an all-in move in 2022. This is, I must say, um, was a mistake on my side because, as I said, uh, I, I I was seeing this as a 10 to 15 years plan how to slowly uh, subjugate the country. Uh, why did he make uh, a you know, Owen uh, move and he practically uh, launched a full-scale war from five directions. Uh, well, I think it's too early to make all these assessments, uh, but uh, certainly um, I would argue the regional um, environment uh, 
um, and situation um, prior to 2022, and also the global environment. That means think of uh, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, then think of, you know, uh, elections in key European countries uh, in 2021. There was a political, um, let's say, vacuum uh, until new governments were built. We had, you know, key election in Germany. Uh, this is, uh, as you know, meanwhile, the key uh, provider of support for Ukraine. So uh, we had the uh, worst energy crisis in 2021 already looming in uh, in Europe. And uh, we had the worst uh, actually indicator for uh, food prices. Uh, this is the FAO index that was reaching already levels of 2011 in December. So all of these were, you know, regional and global environment indicators that probably uh, led also to this decision. But more importantly, what Putin got uh, was also this, um, you know, assurance of comprehensive, um, if you like, full scale comprehensive support coming from China. He has been building up this modus vivendi with Xi Jinping since 2013, when Xi Jinping came to power. And he knew that by launching a full-scale war, and this is my personal assessment, of course, he would not just trigger the uh, systemic competition between United States and China. China at that time was not ready for that kind of um, you know, um, fast-speeded competition, which meanwhile, as we know, has accelerated to the point of the introduction of uh, uh, tariffs and the decoupling has really, really been triggered. But also, um, you know, to in, in a sense, um, Putin correctly bet on China, that China was, if, even if not... Uh, you know, agreeing with uh, the whole decision would actually uh, would uh, would support Moscow in this endeavor, as it turned out. So, going back now to your question, I just wanted to make this clarif clarification: What would be the next steps? Right? What would be the next uh, on his agenda? Now, again, um, first and foremost, what is on his agenda is that he will not give up on attacking Kiev and attacking, you know, Odessa and trying to uh, get as much as possible from Ukraine. And if he's not able for whatever reasons. Uh, we cannot debate now about uh, technical issues of, uh, you know, the technicalities of the war. Uh, Russia has been adapting, but Russia has also made a lot of mistakes. Ukraine has been adapting in the war. But in reality, right now, they are attacking the second uh, largest city, uh, Kharkiv. Uh, but obviously, they're also attacking Odessa. And like I said, my... Um, expectation is that they will be attacking Kiev again. So let's assume, even if partially successful or fully successful, but let's assume um, Putin succeeds in getting a large part of Ukraine, and then we have some sort of negotiations, some sort of ceasefire, and then negotiations. And like I said, this is the uh, best case scenario from Russia's point of view. Because uh, every time when there were ceasefire agreements and, uh, you know, any kind of uh, negotiations, in this case, this will also legitimize uh, the Russian territorial gains. Um, this ceasefire has always been violated. So in a sense, this is actually, um, you know, placed into the, into the uh, cards of uh, Russia. Will, the, I mean, this is the main question. Will Russia actually attack other um, countries in Europe, right? Am I understanding correctly your question? To split NATO, right? So if Putin hates NATO and holds a grudge against NATO, he'll want to take some marginal action that will split the NATO coalition, not so dramatic that everyone is against him. So something like, say, send an army group into Eastern Estonia, claim there's ethnic turmoil, side with the Russian minority, tell a bunch of lies, and then work to subvert the Baltics. Is that in the cards to come next or not? Yes, absolutely. If I were him or if I were to consult him and, you know, uh, he is successful in his, uh, in his actions so far, why would he not try it? I mean, first and foremost, uh, the Baltics, um, 
I think that they already understand uh, the high risk of uh, such situation. Uh, in fact, we have to split it in two parts. The one part being uh, neighbor uh, neighboring countries like Moldova and Georgia, and there uh, I would also go for you know territories because I have already the military presence. I have already, I mean, from Russia's point of view. Um, Territories like uh, Transnistria, which is neighboring uh, Odessa and practically will enable a sanitaire cordon with the European Union, but also uh, in Georgia with the sweeping uh, borders in South Ossetia, uh, for instance, and Abkhazia. Uh, I would just go for these territories because this is, you know, about status and about uh, um, uh, great power exercise. And in the next step, I would actually consider... Um, doing something like this, like an attack on uh, on the Balticum, because first and foremost, uh, there will be a certain uh, regional, um, re regional environment that will allow it. What do I mean by that? If, uh, let's say, uh, the members of uh, NATO and the European Union are somehow in conflictual uh, blocks because of uh, the future of, uh, you know, these uh, organizations. I mean, we do not talk about uh, 2024, obviously, but in the next years, uh, the European Union as a bloc will undergo major shifts and a lot of troubles and, you know, the member states will probably not be um, so coherent in their positions uh, all the time. And the same goes for NATO, especially if we have a very, very different uh, US leadership. So under these circumstances, uh, provocation like this would mean to test the Article 5, to, to let's say, to use the opportunity to show that the Article 5 uh, of NATO is not really going to be activated. This is a possibility. I would say uh, right now, from today's point of view, uh, it is absolutely possible and to some extent probable, but not plausible. But in the next few years, depending on the success of uh, of Russia in Ukraine, uh, and I mean the um, uh, time uh, frame of 2025-2026, I would not exclude, as I said, such possible and probable act by Russia, for instance, on the Balticum. Not so much on Poland. I do not take this um, really seriously, as some analysts are pointing attack, an attack on Poland. I would also think that... Um, uh, Poland may actually seek um, to get uh, nuclear weapons. So in the case, if Poland decides to go nuclear, uh, this, um, you know, um, this question will be automatically answered as to uh, whether Russia would be eager to attack Poland. Now, I know this is a highly speculative question, but if you had to guess... Where would strategic nuclear weapons most likely be used next? What would be your pick? First and foremost, I want to stress that uh, the risk of the use of nuclear weapons has not grown bigger. With all the nuclear blackmail, with all the threats that, you know, nuclear weapons will be used coming from Russia, we saw a precedent in the international relations uh, in you know modern times that uh, country uh, obviously a great power tries to legitimize territorial gains by uh, by the threat of uh, of the use of nuclear weapons but this risk the uh, the the risk of of the realistic use of uh, nuclear weapons hasn't grown bigger that's the first thing that i really want to stress that uh, i still don't see uh, actually, uh, nuclear war uh, taking place. Uh, okay, second point. Uh, Russia has a lot of conventional weapon systems that it is obviously already using against Ukraine. Uh, and it doesn't need, actually, the, te the tactical nuclear weapon against Ukraine. But it doesn't have to be Ukraine, and I mean a strategic nuke. So say North Korea, if they're approaching some kind of strange endgame. Or if American forces are doing badly in the South China Sea and we're tempted to take out a fleet of Chinese warships using a nuke or of all the scenarios you can imagine, which is the one that would surprise you least? Um, 
maybe actually the use of tactical nuclear weapon uh, by Russia against Ukraine. If you outline all these scenarios, uh, I just do not anticipate the United States using the nuclear weapon. Think of all the military defeats that the United States had, you know, experienced over the decades and they still did not use the nuclear weapon, be it Vietnam or Afghanistan or, you know, whatever kind of uh, military endeavors they had. Um, North Korea, I think that North Korea would not uh go for the nuclear weapon because the moment when they decide this they will be annihilated uh, not by one but but by two um critically important players uh, because the whole lifeline for North Korea is coming from China and by extension from Russia and neither China nor Russia will actually allow small player in the international relations to use the nuclear weapon because there is a, a scalability in the international relations. You know, you are allowed as a small, you know, smaller player to do some, uh, some step, you know, to do some steps to create some havoc, uh, in, uh, the regional environment. Uh, if it's in the interest of some of, you know, your supporters, as it is the case right now in North Korea, why is North Korea receiving all this? technological transfer and uh, hold the whole political and diplomatic support from countries like China and uh, Russia. Well, it's obvious because uh, activating the North Korean cart um, plays into the cards of uh, Beijing and Moscow because North Korea creates tensions in the Indo-Pacific and overstretches the attention of uh, the US leadership. Uh, it also complicates the situation with South Korea and South Korea together with Japan are the most important uh, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, allies of the United States. So, so long as North Korea, uh, you know, plays its card smartly and in its um, allowed, let's say, uh, scope of activities, uh, things will be fine. But I just don't see why North Korea would be actually eager to use a nuclear weapon. Um, maybe just because we are at the level of speculation, right? Um, uh, if we are at the level of speculation, one region that would probably see, uh, nuclearization will witness more nuclearization is actually the Middle East because Iran has never been closer to getting the nuclear weapon. And given the most recent, uh, uh, escalatory path between Israel and uh, Iran. Israel has the nuclear weapon. Iran still doesn't have the nuclear weapon. We may argue that this could be one such scenario. Again, I don't see, I don't consider it to be uh, probable. Um, but because you want me to speculate, uh, I will do this uh, with uh, big pleasure. Uh, just to, you know, for the sake of intellectual exercise to, let's say, um, outline a scenario in which Israel would consider uh, using the nuclear weapon for the sake of uh, not allowing Iran to do so. A question about your work at FACE. So we're recording a day after the Iranian helicopter crash, and we don't know what happened. It might have just been a helicopter crash because of bad weather and fog. But surely you have clients calling you, messaging you, pinging you, wanting to know what's going on. What is it you do in the course of the day to be able to respond to them coherently? Like what concrete steps do you take to have a message that is more interesting or more informative than what they might see on Twitter? Uh, well, first and foremost, uh, what I post on Twitter is not what I actually discuss with my clients. So. Uh, uh, of the record. That's very important because I have, uh, um, networks. I have, I have 25 years of, uh, professional background and I have networks of people who have, uh, uh, a proven, you know, track of, um, of analysis and assessment and, uh, are very often also on the ground. So what I do is to, of course, uh, get, uh, as credible information as possible. Um, and, uh, my clients, uh, usually ask exactly these kind of questions as you do right now. 
will there be in the case of uh you know, the example you gave, will there be an escalation uh, between Israel and Iran? Will there be a political turmoil in Iran following this uh, helicopter crash? Will there be a next, uh, you know, uh, military, uh, let's say, episode between Israel and Iran? What will be the cascading effects beyond the region? Or the question that you asked about the military conflict, um, and the possible military attack uh, on Taiwan. This, these are questions that come come out almost every day. But um, uh, pr you know, practically, what I post on Twitter um, is linked to information I read. Uh, these are open source uh, analysis and um, and mostly assessments by other colleagues or uh, articles being published. And I just read, go through these uh, sources, and I post and comment. Uh, that's not uh, the same as when you have to uh, give an answer to uh, to a client uh, who has, for instance, who has a uh, certain exposure uh, in a particular region or has an investment portfolio and this investment portfolio is, uh, for instance, affected by certain, uh, you know, military conflicts and so on and so forth. So it's a very different, uh, you know, different uh, way of, uh, let's say, consulting. Um, Twitter, um, which is now X, is just for fun. This is my... Um, you know, rescue from the day because uh, the whole day I just read and read and read, you know, the uh, a lot of sources, a lot of information. I have a lot of uh, uh, chat rooms uh, on various, um, you know, uh, platforms, the tele telecommunication platforms. Of course, with the time, I can uh, easily identify whether the source is uh, credible or not. I use five different languages. So it's very, very, uh, very um, kind of diverse way of uh, getting, uh, getting uh, information. Uh, I know, uh, for instance, uh, when it comes to a certain conf uh, conflict or certain uh, region, which, uh, you know, sources to use and which... Uh, uh, which platforms, uh, you know, are credible. That is a very, very um, different kind of approach. Uh, if, for instance, uh, a common user on Twitter will just check on Twitter and start reading through the sources. So thanks to this kind of uh, uh, long-term experience, it's very easy for me to track and understand, you know, what is credible, what not. But... Uh, you know, this is only one of uh, several um, pillars of my activities at uh, FACE. So, yes, I have private clients within uh, FACE, but uh, these are individuals uh, from different backgrounds, uh, different, you know, professions who are mostly interested in this world of geopolitics and, uh, you know, do not have uh, the same amount of time to read and to go through all these sources and uh, they just uh, rely on uh, my assessment uh, for specific uh, topics. Now, I must also highlight that uh, the daily business of politics is not my main field. My main field is actually the long term, 10 to 15 years uh, macro perspective. I actually uh, draw scenarios for the future of uh, international relations and for the future of the relations between great powers, for instance, China, United States, or Russia, China, or India, China, and so on and so forth, for the next 10 to 15 years, uh, thanks to uh, trends and risk analysis. And this is something that is derived from the daily uh, you know, daily business of politics, but in fact, it's a different methodology. And this different methodology is not helpful for, let's say, uh, for uh, tactical developments. It is helpful if you, for instance, consider long-term oriented uh, investment based or derived from this macro uh, analysis. What do I mean? Let me give you one example. Um, if now people are talking about uh, semiconductors, right? And an investment in semiconductors would be very smart investment. I have invested in uh, semiconductors six, seven years ago, be knowing that there would be actually a bifurcation of the global system. And one of the critical areas of it will be uh, semiconductors. So having 
the trend projections, the long-term track projections in mind helps you to get the big picture in the long run. If you are, of course, patient and if you really need, uh, if you really want to play this game, you know, the long game. And this is where I'm located mostly, not the, at the tactical level. Do you find prediction markets or metaculus useful at all? I do not do any predictions. That is the whole point. But so they're I information not... sources you could incorporate into, say, a 10 to 15 year forecast. Or do you just think they don't contain much extra information? So the big difference is that, you know, predictions, for instance, where you have like this big prediction houses when it comes to elections, for instance, right? And they yeah. try to predict the outcome of elections. And contrary to predictions, I anticipate possible futures. I do foresight, not, uh, not predictions, not forecast. So I, I cannot forecast anything. What is foresight? Foresight is practically to, um, you know, thanks to the daily observation of events and developments, to categor categorize these uh, events and developments into trends, to assess a possible trend projection that will point to a certain direction in which, for instance, the global system goes. What do I mean by global system? Because I really... I'm really focused on the macro perspective. In my case, the global system, this is my own concept that, concept that I've been working uh, with uh, since 2014. And that is that practically all the relevant socioeconomic networks, uh, you take uh, global finance uh, system, you take a global um, energy system, you take uh, the global finance, uh, uh, trade, um, economy, agriculture. So these most relevant socioeconomic systems that have emerged specifically because of uh, the uh, globalization, uh, the last globalization wave uh, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, in the introduction of uh, the most of the countries into a let's say a global capitalist system so they are now meanwhile uh, more or less intertwined um, and looking at uh, the interactions between these uh, networks and uh, looking at um, you know uh, the way how these systems are undergoing transformation uh, gives me some answers um, as to, you know, in which direction it goes. Let me give you an example. Most of the analysts, uh, you would agree, have been pointing, at least for the last 20 years, uh, towards multipolarity. So the most, the biggest cliche that we've been uh, hearing is that we are sliding into a multipolarity order. We have uh, several big uh, uh, you know, centers of power, several great powers, and so on and so forth. And I just, I, I've never bought into this. Uh, and since 2014, when I started looking at this uh, macro perspective, um, based on this global uh, system concept I've developed, I saw that practically we have only two uh, centers of power, and everything in between is in this gray zone that is oscillating between United States on the one hand and China on the other. Now, Russia, I argue, has taken sight already in 2014. In fact, Russia has been saved by China in following the first interve you know, intervention in Ukraine uh, and following the first launch of Western sanctions uh, when Russia was, uh, you know, facing a serious almost precarious economic situation was saved by China. Now, meanwhile, most of these middle powers are still avoiding uh, taking sides. They want to capitalize from both worlds. A uh, classic example right now is the case of India. India is um, acting as a bridge, as a geopolitical bridge between the two ant antagonists trying to take the best of, you know, of both worlds. Uh, but, um, um, it, it is very, very, how to say, uh, difficult to bring this long-term picture that is, you know, to play out in the next five or 10 or 15 years um, to the daily business of politics. Why? Because people are just not following. They just don't have the time to follow all these trends. And they don't have the time to, you know, go into all these um, uh, specific uh, systemic processes. So 
When I was uh, talking about bipolarity in 2015, or when I was talking about the Dragon Bear since 2014, the Dragon Bear being this modus vivendi of China and uh, Russia, uh, as, uh, you know, uh, modus operandi to coordinate without the necessity to enter any strategic alliance. Um, you know, people were not interested because it did not really affect the daily life of politics. But now you would uh, agree that China, Russia, uh, you know, axis or whatever kind of articles are almost you know, uh, coming, uh, coming out, uh, on a daily, uh, on a daily base. And we are already talking about decoupling and we are already discussing, you know, this kind of bipolarity. This is the point. So we have a 10 years of time span that I have been investing every day into trying to get the trend projections correctly, but it is absolutely not possible to convince anybody else of, 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 you know, of the correctness of this uh, assessment, uh, so long as the reality doesn't, you know, kick in and proves you right. And this is what was happening, at least with most of my assessments. Uh, and this is how I'm right now not stuck in 2024. I'm already in 2030, 2040, and so on and so forth. So most of my assessment um, is actually helping clients to prepare for the long term, uh, for the long term, you know, perspective. Um, I'm not a consultancy like most of these consultancies providing these daily, you know, briefs and, uh, and analysis, uh, telling you about the dynamics uh, in a specific country, uh, explaining you the constellations between the political actors and whatsoever, which is equally important. I'm not denying the importance. Uh, on the opposite. It's just that uh, what I do is so rare and, you know, right now uh, a lot of, I'm observing a lot of consultancies like the big consultancies, Goldman Sachs and so on and so forth, are trying to enter this, you know, business of foresight, uh, geopolitical foresight with big teams and trying, you know, to foresee the future. But in the end, I would argue it's, uh, uh, you know, a methodology that is not so easily to be conducted. And especially it's not easily to be conducted because you have to, um, you know, free yourself from any kind of um, uh, biases, personal biases, and you have to have a model. Uh, now, we may argue some have uh, developed uh, indexes like the geopolitical risk uh, index that is now being let's say, uh, published by the Federal Reserve. They try to track uh, track back different uh, headlines in uh, various news uh, uh, papers and magazines. And then they, ch you know, based on the number, um, empirically, they just point to the severity of a geopolitical risk, like it happened with the, you know, with the Russia's war against Ukraine. Uh, we have different kind of metrics, um, algorithmic and empirical one. Uh, my approach is very qualitative one, and it's really based and derived from what I just uh, explained to you. Felina Chakarova, thank you very much. Thank you.